In the beginning there was Jack, and Jack had a groove, and from this groove came the grooves of all grooves. And while one day viciously throwing down on his box, Jack boldly declared, let there be house, and house music was born. I never thought that my songs were going to start anything. It was the stuff I was writing at home that I wanted to listen to. From the underground clubs of Chicago, House has grown into the biggest musical phenomenon since rock and roll. If somebody told me when I was younger that this music that we were making in our basement would be the shot heard around the world, I would say, give me some of what you smoking, pal. Because it's just unbelievable. Fifteen years later, and House dominates pop music. From Madonna to U2, no one has escaped its restless beat. I think the house is a feeling, and I think that if you don't feel it, it can't be house. It's a feeling that's turned DJs into superstars. It's not just about playing the latest bunch of tunes. It never has been and it's made nightclubs into global brands. I certainly know that when a DJ gets out there and performs fantastically and does a brilliant job and there's a wicked crowd, you really can't beat it. You know the score. It's not just a type of music, it's a way of life. It's just a feeling in the clubs that you get from these driving tracks, these great tracks, great songs. And I just see all of these people enjoying this music that they don't really understand why it was even created. You know what I'm saying? They don't even understand the basis of what House is trying to do from the get. It ain't about pop and eat. It is. One more time, I wanna this is the story of the people who made House. The soundtrack to our lives. Anything that starts off underground is House to me. I don't care how big it gets. If it started out underground, and, and it had that, that big club feel, and that's house. We stole everybody's music. I mean, that's how we created our sound. The way the Chicago guys did it, they just took like disco grooves and rehooked them up, you know what I mean? beginning it was the gay and black people that really kept dance music alive disco dance music uh, it was really danceable R&B music that we were dancing to and it wasn't until Saturday Night Fever came along that it exploded and every goomba in the you know the suburbs start dancing if I can't have you At the end of 1977, Travolta showed everyone how to do the hustle. Disco came out of the underground. As the whole world caught Saturday Night Fever, Mel Cherin's partner, Michael Brody, had a vision of a new kind of nightclub. Michael and I said, if people can dance together, they can live together. And that's why it was so important to bring all kinds of people, black, white, straight, and gay, together with music. And one day, Michael called me and said, Mel, I found the guy that's going to make it happen for me. And he was talking about Larry LeVan. This is 84 King Street, Paradise Garage. Larry was the talent. Larry was the music. Larry was the imagination. Larry was the spunk. Not to just, you know, polish up Larry, but the truth of it is the truth. Larry was everything. Opened in January 1978, the Paradise Garage had the biggest dance floor and the best sound system in New York. But it was resident DJ Larry Levan 
who made the garage legendary. Sometimes you get a thing from me and you want my company. Yes, you do, baby. He played music sometimes that was so intense, music that made you get down, made your body go down. He'd say, see that crowd over there? Watch what happens when I put this record on. It was like Snake Charmer. He made you go like this, he made you go like that. He wasn't great at mixing. It was He could if he wanted to. That wasn't his thing. He knew how to play a song. He wouldn't just play one sound or one style. Drop in disco, uh, various different rhythms. That whole night you went in, you just came back singing songs and you went home just thinking about what happened last night. Such an exciting time and place. New York was the heart, and that's what attracted me to New York. I had to go because I was so into the music. You gotta push it to me, baby. Push it to me, baby. You gotta start it to me. Technically a genius. The actual bass speakers were named after Larry. They were called the Van Horn. You know, he controlled everybody. That was his job. He would shut the music and go down, get a ladder, and clean the mirror ball if he didn't think it was clean enough. And I don't know where blue blast the music. Everybody, oh. Come on, you can get it. First time I went, I was 17 years old, and I was like, oh my God, I've never seen a place like this before. When you first went into it, it was like entering Dante's Inferno. They spiked the punch, okay, and they would tell you that they were going to spike it that particular night. So that meant that the whole crowd was, was just all on ass. You know, and next thing you know, you're just like so spacey, and then somebody's handing you a popper, and you're doing the popper. You know, and 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 and, and everybody hired playing loose. Yeah. Uh, the deepest corners of the club. All right, you you have people engaging in sex. You know. I could never figure out how people could stay up that long because I was. I was kind of quite young then, and I wasn't aware that they were doing drugs. So me and my friend, we used to just stop all night and, you know, come seven, eight in the morning, we were literally exhausted, but then we brought out the coffee and we were on the coffee, and I always used to fall asleep on the subway going home and end up stuck in the Bronx. A taste maker of resolute individuality, Larry was an inspiration to a generation of DJs. Larry could create a house party atmosphere with 2,000 people. It really got me into the, to the whole club and, and DJ kind of thing. Paradise Garage set trends. Paradise Garage was one of the first of its kind. And 20 years later, people are still talking about the influence Paradise Garage had on music. Disco sex! Disco sex! But only 18 months after Saturday Night Fever, dance music was facing a massive backlash in America. Disco sex! Disco sex! Disco sex! Yeah! And Steve Dahl was blowing up disco records out of Comiskey Park and, you know, getting all the rock and roll heads to join in. And, uh, you know, there was a huge backlash on, on disco music. This is now officially the world's largest anti-disco rally! In 1979, DJ Steve Dow led an anti-disco campaign that struck a chord throughout suburban America. It was more about blowing up all this nigger music and, um, you know, destroying disco. <laughs> Strangely enough, I was an usher, working his way towards his first synthesizer at the time. What I noticed at the gates were people were bringing records, and some of the records were disco records, and I thought those records were kind of good. And some of those records were just black records. They weren't disco. They were just black R&B records. And I should have taken that as a tone for what the attitude of these people were. 
I know that nobody was bringing Metallica records by mistake. They might have brought a Marvin Gaye record, which wasn't a disco record. And that got accepted and blown up with the all with along with Donna Summer and Anita Ward. And so it felt very racial to me. Is it all over my face? Too black and too gay for middle America. Disco went out of fashion as quickly as it begun. I'm in love dancing. Is it all Radio stations switched to rock and pop. Record companies closed their dance labels. Steve really hurt the uh, the dance music business. I mean, back in the day during the disco era, uh, it was amazing the amount of music we were getting and the popularity of, of disco music. And all of a sudden, we had such a backlash. I mean, it went from being able to work in the nightclub of your choice and having a huge crowd and making good money to basically not even being able to get a gig at that point. Of course, in the underground, it was business as usual. I'm surprised to see your suitcase at the door. Remember the good times, don't you want some more? It's not a perfect love, but I'll defend it. Because I believe in what God had changed. In 1977, club promoter Robert Williams brought a young DJ from New York to play at his new club, The Warehouse. His name was Frankie Knuckles. Because of Frankie's music style, no one could touch him at that point. I'll be right there. Yes, I will. Oh. Going down to Frankie's club, he had a certain mystique about himself and in, in, in the music that nobody knew but him and, and a few others. Knuckles played the classics, you know. He, he would bang stuff out, but he's more classy, more classy. He played a lot of more underground things that were, you know, like loose, loose joints. Uh, is it all over my face? And uh, I think Anita Ward ring my bell before he ever hit commercial. I mean, he was playing probably three, four, five months before he even came out. It was the only place in the city that you could go and hear this this type of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had the only the that was the thing. That's where that's how I started off because there was nowhere else to go. Cause baby, there ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no mountain low enough. Ain't no river high enough. Knuckles brought the energy of New York's gay scene to Chicago. Getting to you. It wasn't long before straight kids were checking out the club. This music was really something that would grab your soul. I mean, if you could feel the groove, and I mean, the basses were heavier. You know, the, the vocals were very soulful and uplifting, you know, and everything. So it was just, and for gay people especially, you know, they're very animated. This was just really, I mean, they would take this music to new heights. Like, hands in the air and flailing, and they're on the walls, and they're jumping on top of speakers, and they're all from this end to the other, and I'm just like, wow, this is incredible. You had never seen, you, you knew that there were gay people around, you knew that they partied, but you had never seen like two guys you kiss in front of you. Yeah. The place was like this throbbing, hot, uh, you know, mixtures of just body to body. And I mean, you know, yes, I remember it was, you know, all black people and, and mostly all black men. There were a few women, not, not very many, you know, but it was just a really cool place. and. It made me feel at home. I think at that time it changed a lot of people's perception and stuff. I think that a lot of straight people found like it's okay you could talk to somebody that's gay. When you look up and guys are kissing, you're like, well, they're not kissing me, so you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, I'm doing my thing. The warehouse was a sensation in Chicago, but no one could have imagined that it was about to give its name to a whole new style of music. If you were a DJ in Chicago, if you wanted to have the records, there was only one place to go, and that was Imports. This is where Imports was. People would come in looking for warehouse music, and we would put, you know, as heard at the warehouse or as played at the warehouse. And then eventually we just shortened that down to, because people also just in the vernacular, they started saying, yeah, what, what's up with that house music? Now, at this time, they were talking about the old old classics, the Sal Soul, the Philly classics and such. So we put on the labels um, for the spins, we'd say house music. 
And people would start coming in eventually just asking, yeah, where's the new house music? House was originally used to simply describe the style of music played at the warehouse. Primarily it was a lot of the old disco records and, and not the poppy type disco record. You know, it wasn't instant replay from Dan Hartman, but it was Scat Brothers Walk the Night. And we used to just dig in the crates and find something that people forgot about and bring it back. With such a limited supply of old tunes, DJs became increasingly creative on the decks. Chicago style is to have a tight blend, to have everything even, to sound musical, you know, when you're not mixing vocals on top of vocals, you know, you, you're finding a place where one record goes with another and it feels right. If you watch the crowd and you see that they like a certain part of the record, then you can repeat that part, you can tease them with it, bring it in for a second, take it out, you know. Like there's a part in here where it goes, um, dum, dum, but it doesn't come in till the end. So say I wanted to bring that part in, then I would, if I had it planned, I'll just show you how I would move to that section. Like right now it's on the beginning of the record. I'm gonna take this one and move the record up to the um, dum. I might slam it. Say I wanted to play that part, but I want to get to the verse quicker. I'll just do that. Basically, if I would just use the double copies to just be able to manipulate the record to where whatever section I want to use, whatever whatever I want to do. Like I may intend to play the whole record, but the crowd may not want to hear it. These tight mixing techniques were honed to perfection on radio station WBMX by the Hot Mix Five. Live on location from Chicago. This is the Hot Mix. Dance Party with Scott Smoking Seals. Well, the original Hot Mix 5 would be myself, Scott Smoking Seals, Kenny Jam and Jason, Farley Funk and Keith, who is now Farley Jackmaster Funk. He had a, he had a change of name there. Uh, Mickey Mix and Oliver, and uh, Ralphie, the, it was Ralphie Rock and Rosario back then. I think initially there actually would have been six of us, and one of the guys didn't show up that day. <laughs> Poor Jeff Davis. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> It was just such a mystique to that whole show, you know, Saturday Night Live, Ain't No Jive. I remember that was what they used. If you went around the country and you listened to other DJs play, if you went to New York or even some of the underground clubs here, you would have uh, maybe a seven-minute record. They would play six and a half minutes of the record, and then they would just segue out at the end. The Hot Mix 5, on the other hand, was different. They would play a minute and a half, two minutes of the record, take the best part out, play the break, repeat the break a couple times, and just give you the meat of the record that you wanted and forget the rest of the garbage that was in there as filler and that's what really really made the hot mix five style they were doing these mixes sort of like what you were hearing at the club but mixes on radio and at that time it was unique to me and maybe unique to a lot of other people too you know as the show developed and you know we were, we were trying to do more and more creative things you know, you'd get out the razor blade and start cutting tape, you know, with reel-to-reels and stuff and trying to make the stuff even more creative than it already was with two turntables and a mixer. But it was when DJ started adding drum machines that house really started to take shape. People just figured, hey, you know, <laughs> let me try and make, make up my own kind of, you know, beats or rhythms. Uh, to compensate for the lack of music. Sometimes it seems the going is just too rough. And things go wrong no matter what I do. Now it's the house music. Like it's just too 
Ooh, back in the day to try to give it a harder edge. Something soft like that with a hard beat like that. Nothing like what hardcore is today, but back back then this was our hardcore, believe me. Record with beats, a cappella, both together. Uh, to take it to a, a higher significance, when, when you turn a drum machine on, you just play beats, people would just scream. You take the kick drum out, bring it back in, and just scream all night. And they would they would do these tracks so that when they DJ, you know, that everybody would run to the DJ booth and go like, wow, what's that? What's new? What's, you know, bam, what's that? And so, it, they sort of, it was sort of like a status thing. It became a status thing. Who could come up with the hottest track? Competition between DJs was getting intense. I would say right around 83, 84. Um, my DJ name was Steve Sook Hurley, and I said I was gonna, I was gonna um, start calling myself Jackmaster Silk. And Farley was my roommate at the time. And when he said that, I was like, how can you change your name to Steve Jackmaster Hurley? I'm the real Jackmaster because uh, I put this like, char, char. I do that in all my records and I sample it, right? By Friday, his name was changed to Farley Jackmaster Funk. I went and said, Farley Funk and Keith is dead. He no longer exists. There's a new guy in town. His name is Farley Jackmaster Funk. Needless to say, Steve was on his way to the radio station with his tape, ready to make the new announcement that he is going to change his name to Steve Jackmaster Hurley, and almost ran to a pole. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was the worst. <laughs> In 1983, a new club opened in Chicago, the Music Box. Its DJ Ron Hardy had an intensity that took clubbing to a whole new dimension. This was Ron's club. This was definitely in nobody else's. It was owned and ran by Robert Williams, but it was Ron Hardy's club. He would never, ever uh, not be there. You know, the kids would not even come if he wasn't there. Ron had people just, I don't know, losing their minds down there. You would hear this music. I mean, you didn't have to be this close. I mean, as soon as you turn the corner, you just hear this thumping, beating music. It was the loudest music I'd ever heard in my life. I mean, it physically should be. I'm not talking about like emotionally I'm talking about physically it was so loud that it would move me in my you it would move me when you bring in the bass boom 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 I would shake right like that Ronnie would bring you keep you going and keep you going that's what they call him heart attack Hardy he would keep you going and going and going until you like just actually have a heart attack <laughs> and then all I know is the people were screaming Ron Hardy's name Ron Hardy Ron Hardy pump that Ron Hardy doing all this and I was like I don't know why screamed like that for me before there will never be another place like that where Ron Hardy was doing what he was doing. I mean this man, it was like voodoo with dance music, you know? If I had to think about it today, or if I was thinking about it when I was playing records every time, I wouldn't play. I would stop. Because I'd look at these people, I'd look at these clubs, I'd say this is bullshit. And I would just leave. That's why I can't think about it because there's no, there's no comparison. It, it, pay, it, makes, it, it just makes everything else shit. He opened every night with Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. He played real fast. That's because he was high on heroin and things were kind of sounding slow to him, you know. So he speeded it up. <laughs> and in doing so, he speeded the party up. 
It's all type of drugs went around there. Yeah, I mean, a acid was big, um, MDA, yeah, MDA was big, MDA, MDA, which is a precursor of ecstasy. You know, an MDA <laughs> and stuff like that, you just mixed it in, in a cocktail and or, gulped it down. Or, or, or eat it, or lick it. Yeah, or, or well, licking yeah. it was a hard way to take that shit, boy. Oh my god, I mean, that's just like straight, straight yeah. into your system, you know, that and it tasted cute. terrible. We were kind of into this punk out here and playing music like um, like some of the Blondie tunes and uh, the B-52s. Rock Lobster. And when they did the part, we said, down, down, down. Everybody went down on the ground. We'd come out of craft work and go in the, uh, you know, one nation under a groove. <laughs> so it was like a really weird time for music because you had all these black kids dancing to punk music. Basically, when we were doing the punk out age, it was basically you would take a woman, you would bend her over, and you were just there, just basically grinding on her ass, dancing. This was punking out. And that kind of then when Jackie came about, it just kind of carried over from that. <laughs> jacking, uh, um, first became aware of jacking at the music box. It was just part of the language, part of the culture. Just people say, you know, I'm going to go down to the box, you know, I'm going to jack my body. It would be like maybe one girl, and it would be seven guys dance with one girl, and they, she'll be in the middle, and they would be in a circle around her, and they would jack, which was like they, she might be bent over or something, they would be standing behind her. Guys jacking women, guys jacking guys, girls jacking girls. Jacking with this fucking speaker was always a, a hometown favorite. Or the wall. You know? Or the wall, <laughs> whatever was handy. If you were lucky enough to have a person with you, then yeah, you jack into that person. But if you didn't, you find a pole, you find a wall, it a doorway. You just get on the door and you just jack, 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 jack in your pocket. All night long. Okay. And, and, yeah, and it was also really yeah. kind of contagious. You know, once you would start in one part of the dance floor, before you knew it, you were engaged the dance floor. in this oh, sexual yeah. pantomime. I've dance. even heard some stories about more than just the jacking going on behind the speakers. And I mean, you could do all sorts of freak shit on the floor. You know, I mean, no shit. You could be grabbing girls' breasts. You could be putting your finger in in, in certain places. You know, I mean, uh, on the TV, floor. Watch <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This TV, right? Sorry, sorry. In the music box, they were having sex. <laughs> you know. You could do all sorts of unspeakable things on the dance floor, but that was on the dance floor. That was like its own world. Once the lights came community. on and the party was over with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you were going home. This place is probably responsible for some children. Everybody that I took there, uh, it changed their lives. Everybody it did. It inspired everybody I know. House was about to produce its very first star. In 1984, a demo tape unlike any other spread like a virus through the clubs of Chicago. friend had a copy of 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 a copy. One guy would get a copy of a tape from Frankie and it would be copied thousands of times all over the city. It was this one little sequence line and it was just like a three note line and just repeated. But when that came on, everyone knew that that was your love. I mean the crowd, everybody, it was a big thing. Everybody was singing along with the song. Everybody in the whole crowd. And it was the shit. The track was bumping. It was the shit. Jamie was God to us. We didn't we had no idea he was like a kid in his bedroom making music. I thought Jamie was a millionaire in Europe somewhere. I, I didn't even know he was black. <laughs> I hear the song and I just remember the reasons why I wrote it. So, but a lot of people tell me, you know, that song touched me and, and this and this, and I'm grateful, you know, that that happened for them. The son of strict parents, Jamie hadn't even visited the clubs that your love was being played in. Uh, I can't let go. We grew up <laughs> listening to like classical music, gospel music, um, some pop. Um, some R&B, so 
I was pretty well-rounded. It's just that it was only certain days you could play that music <laughs> in the house, pretty much. I was in a relationship with a young lady by the name of Lisa Harris, and we were pretty serious. And it was the first relationship that I had that I felt was really real for me. I was always waiting, looking for that one individual person to, to feel like I have a connection with. And when I met her, um, it just happened. I kind of like, and when I talk to her still, because we, we still talk, I tell her if it wasn't for her, these songs wouldn't have been written. I sent this tape to every company in, in New York and they turned it down. This is not what we're looking for. We're not into this. So I was like, fine. But his tape was huge in the clubs. Your love was the year zero in the evolution of house music. Listen to it, man. It's just a brilliant track. You know, you you take a hit nowadays, and they, and, uh, and and you ask somebody what was so good about it. They can't really tell you. All know, oh, this hook, the hook, all oh, you know, all oh, the bass line, all oh, that. But you know, a great song is a great song. And that Jamie did some great songs, like three or four in a row, and they went all over the city, but they just weren't out on record. I mean, I, I feel like it was a divine hand in it because it was so many different variables. If if I wasn't in this situation, I wouldn't have wrote the song. I wasn't going to ever take the tapes of Frankie, so my friend had to do it. If he never would have did it, you know, none of this would be how it is now. I wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you right now. So it's it's a divine situation for me. I mean, it's still to this day <laughs> totally hypnotic. The version oh, yes. of Your Love that got released was not the best night, one. Too. It was it was it was the okay. One that was, yeah, the one the one that was that was released. It yeah, wasn't the no, best no, one, you know. No, I mean, the, the original very still one. isn't released. Which and I still need to get a copy of that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I got one. Okay. Um, but it's just oh, on tape because it never was on record. record. No longer about recycling old disco. House was something new. Something fresh. It just wasn't on vinyl until on and on. Jesse Saunders on and on. The very first house record? To this day, I've had people offer me $1,000 for this, if not more. I had noticed that all of the girls thought that he was such a cute guy DJ. And he said he was singing, so I thought I'd put him in front. You know, I thought that, you know, okay, you have a band, you got a cute guy up front, you know, heartthrob for the girls, you got the musicians taking care of business behind the scenes. So Vince, you know, Vince is, is the type of person, he's just Mr. Information. He just go, oh, we do this, and my father has a record label, and it does this, and the pressing plan is here, and this is how you do the label, and this is what you do this, and blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting there like, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and we didn't, like, know what we were making. We were just making music from what we listened to at the club. Everything was four on the floor, so that's what we started making, <laughs> you know. I recorded, like, the drums here and the bass and put, like, overdubs and the keys, all kinds of effects. He sent stuff on there, and then Vince and I, you know, did, like, this corny little rap. And Jesse liked this line from White Horse where it said, Bitch, wanna be rich, got to be a bitch. So it goes on and on, and then Jesse says, Bitch. <laughs> Jesse and Vince got their tune into the clubs and onto the radio. By the time they turned up at imports, etc., On and On was a must have record. Like, where'd you get this record? You're like, we made it. It was us. We did it. it. We did this record. And the guy said, really? What do you mean? I'm like, we made the record. 
It's our record. It's on our record company. See? That's my handwriting on the label. Vince wrote this. He took, this was just a blank cover. He hand wrote this himself. He goes, how many you got? I'm like, you might want to think about it. Because I got a thousand of them in my car. How many do you want? And he says, I'll take them all. How much do you want for them? And I very quickly thought to myself, okay, it costs us a dollar to make the records. And I want to get two dollars at least. Because then I'll make 50 cents and Jesse will make 50 cents and we'll be cool. Um, I said, four dollars. Figuring a guy will want to negotiate me down. He said, okay. And he wrote me a check for $4,000. Jesse and I walked out of the store, got in the car, and screamed. And we were selling 20 and 30,000 records just in Chicago. I was maybe 17, 18 years old driving a Corvette, you know, and flying to New York and doing all this stuff that, you know, up until that point was all just, you know, pipe dreams to me. It didn't sound like much, but on and on was the spark that triggered the Chicago house boom. That was the single most important record to me of the 20th century because it let the non-musician know that he could make music. Everybody thought when they first heard the record was, gee, I can do better than that, and why don't I give it a shot? The first thing you have to do is you have to start off with a strong kick drum. And then you have to have a bass line. And from there, you build on it. You build on it with uh, snare drums. You build on it with the hi-hat. You build on it with the rim shot, with the claps. And then we just needed something to say over it. So I ended up saying time to jack and just kind of slow pitch my voice down a little bit. and. Uh, History was made. <laughs> I can remember the first time I heard it played in the club was uh, it was a club on Rush Street called the Mars Bar, and Barley was playing there. And I took it to him, and he looked at it. He put it on. And he listened to it in the headphones. About five seconds later, he slammed the fader over, and you hear just this thump, boom, 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 boom. And then all of a sudden, you hear, time to jack. The crowd just went fucking wild. People just lost their minds. By 1985, every kid in Chicago with a drum machine was making house. For a time, Chicago house just took over. You couldn't go to a club and just not hear our music, and it was a great moment. Now it was about to take flight outside Chicago. They didn't know how to play their instruments. They, most of them weren't even musicians. They came along with the music media, with the electronic revolution. They learned how to beat out simple rhythms on, on the drum machines that nobody knew about and they learned how to use sequencers when sequencers were strange toys uh, they were innovators pioneers uh, it was just a special time larry sherman owned chicago's only record pressing plant as the first wave of house tracks emerged he launched the tracks label the guy brought in a tape today. I tried to have a record out within within a week. That's kind of what set tracks apart was the ability to get the materials into the marketplace. We didn't have to wait for somebody to say, "Well, I think this might be a good record. I might buy it." Uh, we came in and said, "This is a great record, and you need it. This is house. Do you like it? It's wonderful stuff." Early releases like Adonis's No Way Back defined the emerging house sound. But it was business skill that made tracks the dominant label. Vinyl at that time was running about 70 cents a pound or 
30 cents a record roughly. Uh, I couldn't afford it to produce large quantities because the cash flow was terrible. So I bought large quantities of new unsold records. Then he'd grind them up and he'd reprocess them again and make new records, which is why his records always had the pops and they weren't like very well pressed and they would warp and everything because it, was, it wasn't virgin vinyl. And I apologize to the public on this one. The reason that uh, some of the records were at best shoddy at some times was because I just ran the parts. If they would still fit in the machine and didn't come out, I was running records. Made the best record you could make for a quarter. By now, club kids were firing the music's evolution. In late 85, a couple of music box fans spawned a new style of house by abusing a machine designed for karaoke. Well, basically, we started using the 303 just to try to make bass lines because when we first started making music, it, it sucked. So I made this rhythm, what you hear playing right now. And it's just playing straight. He said, but I can't figure out how to work this thing. It's still doing this weird, like, sound. You know, it's like, I don't know how to program it. So he's, he's like, figure out maybe, he said, maybe you can figure out how to program it because it didn't come with a book. And so I was like, instead of trying to program it, I just started turning knobs. I was like, Ugh. And he's like, well, what you doing? I'm like, oh, I'll turn these knobs. He said, keep doing that. I'm like, I'm turning the knobs. And we just sitting there for like 30, 40 minutes. I'm just turning knobs. And like, yeah, I like that. I like that. There's been 5,000 Acid House records after that one. Nobody did it like Pierre. Pierre did it in a, in a musical way that followed the mood of the song. Everybody else just turned knobs, man. No, it's never been done like that. So if anybody would like, would be daring enough to play this, it would be Ron Hardy. He ended up playing it four times that night. The first time he played it, the people didn't really know how to react to it. He played it again. People was looking like, hmm, I guess it's early. He playing some crazy stuff. The fourth time, they lost their mind. And that was, that was the birth of acid right there. Ron Hardy gave me D DJ Pierre's tape. Marshall Jefferson was the, uh, the ear for Larry Sherman. Larry Sherman had no clue what was going on with the music. You know, I said, Larry, you got to put this out. You got to put it out. He said, there's no words on it. I said, yeah, but you said that about can you feel it? Can You Feel It brought jazz sophistication to the Raw House beat. But despite a string of classics, bitterness was bubbling at Tracks Records. You get the contract, he tells you how much money he's going to give you, and that's it. And meanwhile, this guy could be making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on your music. All you had to do is say, this is a standard contract. And oh, well, if it's a standard contract, where do I sign? You know, A lot of kids, you know, for $1,000, Larry would give them $1,000 and say, but I own everything. If you don't have the money, you can't go get a lawyer to read the contract for you. The retainer fee alone with a lawyer is going to kill you. Larry's admonitions to his artists who are signing up without lawyers he would always, he would, at least I heard him say this, and uh, he seemed to be, you know, uh, doing it, he was, I mean, he seemed to be proud of the fact that he was giving them this, like, warning in advance, you know, he says, oh, look, you say, I want you to know that this is a business. He says, and if I can screw you, he says, I will, you know what I mean? And he meant it, you know what I mean? And, uh, and not that he's in, uh, any more unusual than any other record company, in my opinion, but I always admired him because he was honest enough to tell them in advance that, you know, you might be, you know, in for a real experience here. The pioneers of House had sold their tracks to Sherman. But as record sales boomed, some felt hard done by. 
I mean, what would happen is they would go there with their first record because he was only planting town. They had reservations, but the thing of wanting to get their music out was just a little stronger, and so they're trying to do the best deal that they can do. But uh, it just wasn't good enough, <laughs> you know? Larry's deal is a deal. It's an opportunity. Guys get to put records out. But you may not make any money. That's just the deal. <laughs> the paperwork is right. The people got paid handsomely in the, in, in the early stages. Uh, it's just a general consensus in-house that they're of the opinion they sold more records than the business dictated. Move your body. The burning desire to Move dance had defiantly spawned on new music. Move your body. It was not without Move cost. Both Larry Levan and Ron Hardy were to die of drug-related illness in 1992. Your body. But their legacy is a music that has taken flight far beyond the clubs of its birth. Without such pioneering DJs, dance music would never have flourished. Without labels like Tracks, house music may never have left Chicago. But without Marshall Jefferson, house wouldn't have Move Your Body. Everybody said it wasn't house music when I first did it. That piano, what the hell is that doing there? You know, who you think you are, Fast Domino? You, know, <laughs> yeah, like, you don't put no piano on no house record. That ain't house music. So I called it the house music anthem. <laughs> and the response to the house music national anthem, Move Your Body, was just uh, international. I equate the record to like Bill Haley and the Comets, Rock Around the Clock, right? It, rock and Roll was before that song, but that named, that, that gave everybody the name. Because right after Move Your Body came out, reporters started coming from all over the world, what's house music, what's house music, what's house music, right? So, you know, Move Your Body said, gotta have house music all night long with that house music, you can't go wrong, you know, give me that house music. They just called the house music anthem. House had a sound. It had a name. By 1986, it was. When I went to London, it was all over the radio, all the clubs. I said, this scene reminded me of Chicago. For for me, it's an amazing thing to see that. Um, Another country embraces our music bigger than the country that we're from. House music's bigger than any one person. It's bigger than all of us. Um, and I would have to say to have a portion of its inception be my legacy. You know, I feel that that's just an honor. I'm The whole scene I've been around all my life was predominantly minority. When I came across the ocean, it was the opposite. I was like, they think they, they like house music like that? In just three years, the house music of Chicago was to win over dance floors from Manchester to Ibiza. When you first heard this stuff, it was just blew your bollocks off. While its combination with ecstasy was to transform British society. It was the first time that people actually let themselves go. At the time, it was a revolution. Some, you knew things were going to change and, you know, music was going to change, everything was going to change. This is the story of the music and people who created the Summer of Love. It was life changing. It was life changing for those people on the dance floor. It was life changing for me in the DJ box, and it was life changing for the bouncers on the front door. Check this out. In 1985, house music existed in just one city, Chicago. 
everybody was DJ. So we we needed something to, to uh, catapult us into another category to make more money, and that became, um, you know, just fragmented into to making records at that time. The DJs of Chicago had created a new dance music from the ashes of disco. In 1985, legendary producer Steve Silk Hurley created his first hit. We pressed it up, it went through the roof. Hurley took house to number nine in the American dance charts. he didn't get the chance to release his planned follow-up. To date, my biggest record in the UK is uh, Love Can't Turn Around. And uh, it came together from, uh, once again, uh, it's crazy, it came together from an idea Steve Silk Hurley had. Farley was over at Jesse's place, and he said he had this idea. And so he couldn't execute that. When he knew that the three of us could. We brought in Dwayne to do the solo, the piano stuff on there. We brought in Vince because Vince was like the lyricist on everything. Now this is how it started. My dreams all broken hearted because I want you. We'll never be the same because you play these silly games and yet I want you. We didn't have a lead vocalist. I had recently recorded a song with this guy Daryl Pandy, a song called Climax that was on Ray Barney's Bright Star Records. This guy was a motherfucker of a singer. And I had heard somewhere that he had played the Cowardly Lion in the local performance of The Wiz. And he's gay. So to us, it was like, we don't want to have anything to do with this guy. <laughs> you know, because he's constantly telling us how he wants to try to get with us. He had a big bellowing voice and he was very churchy. And we thought that the kids were into that spiritual shit, man. Motherfuckers yelling and screaming on the records, you know. So. We thought that he would go over like gangbusters in the club. So we brought this guy in and he sang the fuck out that tune. Now this is how it started. My dreams all broken hearted. Yet I won't give, baby. We'll never be the same. Cause you play those silly games. And yet I won't give, girl. Farley started playing a shit on the radio. And you know. Copy started flying out the door. Record goes on the radio, blows up, huge, selling numbers. But Love Can't Turn Around divided the friends who had created it. You just want everybody to keep calling your name, Farley, Farley, you know, so it, it got a little bit out of hand at that time. Within 30 days, I'm in Rocky Jones' office, and he's cutting us a check for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. You know, and I'm sitting up thinking, I didn't expect anything out of this record, but I'm making money. You know, you're working with your friends, and you think that, you know, I guess everybody do the right thing when somebody gets paid, you know, that everybody's sharing the wealth, but you come to find it, it's just not like that. I never got a friggin' penny. I don't think even Daryl got the money that he should have gotten. But it was the track that catapulted House into the UK. Went top ten in August 1986. I played it at home and I knew it was just going to tear the place up, and it did. And then I played it at the Mug Club, and it, likewise, same thing happened there. When I first started going clubbing, all the best clubs were gay, you know, and, and we would go down there and not pretend to be gay, but uh, certainly pretend not to be shocked at everyone else in there, just to go and hear the best music. DJs who played house in straight clubs in London got a less enthusiastic reaction. Well, sometimes you came up to me at a warehouse party in London with this kind of, um, you know, those kind of cloth rear groove caps they used to wear and the steel toe cap, Doc Martens and white socks and 501s and everyone flying jacket. A look later developed by Bross, if I remember correctly. Um, they uh, said, well, I'll get this poof's music off. 
Then I started getting these notes passed to me saying, why are you playing this Chicago homo music? I had a few kind of like things thrown at me. And I was called gay a lot as well. Most of the clubbers were into rare groove and hip hop and, you know, everyone was cool and down and that kind of stuff. I think a lot of the hip hop kids thought it, the music was quite faggy. <laughs> they, they, uh, you know, they didn't get it. And in fact, uh, uh, most people didn't get it. No one's used to it. No one was used to that sort of tempo and, and energy. So, um, you know, it took a while. But um, up north, everyone was into it. Everyone were into it long before we were, as far as like, you know, going out and dancing to it and stuff. Since the late 70s, soul fans in the north of England had held the torch for up tempo dance music. Bum, 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 I'm on my way, you know, and shit like that. You know, we grew up in a real northern soul sort of thing. When House arrived in the 80s, it fitted into the northern soul all-night dance culture. I think there was a lot of similarities. It was like, you know, uh, very soulful, four-to-the-floor fast music. When the Hacienda started playing records from Detroit and Chicago. It wasn't that different, maybe, to what DJs had done a generation before. I mean, when we first started the Friday night at the house, we got quite a lot of the old northern boys coming down. When I was playing, like, Adonis, No Way Back, I mean, I could see lots of people doing northern soul dances. Opened by Factory Records in 1982, the Hacienda was modelled on New York clubs, like the Danceteria. It was empty for the first five years, completely empty. And then at the beginning of 86, it began to do some business. Friday nights were quite cool, not massive business. And that was where, I always used to say, Pickering and Park used to play house music in 86. In fact, it was Pickering Park and John De Silva, who I never give enough credit because his name doesn't begin with P. I think Manchester was the epicentre of the whole house scene as such. I mean, there was things happening in London, but I mean, I moved to Manchester Apart from the fact that I was around here, it was mainly really just simply for the hacienda. And um, you know, if you wanted to be if you wanted to be a house DJ, it was it was the place to come. But when you went in the Yassi, you heard stuff that nobody else got for fucking months. As more Chicago house trickled into the UK, DJs up north embraced this new black dance music from America. You just had to clear out all the nonsense and make space for this exciting new stuff. DJs in Manchester weren't just listening to house, they were making it. the first British house single. That's the original sleeve, which we, we bagged ourselves from a little room in Islington in London. I remember that um, we didn't have any tape or anything to put it onto. We, we actually recorded it onto cassette and pressed it off the cassette. And it sounds fantastic, you know, it sounds really good. It's a lesson for us all who spend thousands of pounds in recording studios. House music had crossed the Atlantic. In 1986, its Chicago Godfathers came on tour. There was Frankie Knuckles, Marshall Jefferson, um, Fingers Inc. with Larry Heard, a genius, absolute genius, uh, and Adonis. Everybody was wearing ties and shirts and you know they were nice and neat and the DJs you know they were they were back announcing every every track and it was great but of course they got to Manchester and there was queues 
you know, the, the RCA and the queues around the block, and packed, and everyone just going mad. Everyone knew the records, treated them like superstars. When I came back on another tour the next year, everybody's wearing these damn smiley T-shirts and go, ah! <laughs> so it's big change. And just in one year, you know, one year we come. We come there, it's nice straight country, and the next year we come back, it's the summer of love. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great feeling, you know, that some people from Chicago had arrived in Manchester, and between us, we had a great scene. They understood the music, and it was kind of like a, a, a common bond where people could come together, and just that, that feeling was more of an inspiration, you know, like, you know, people really need something, they really want to come together, you know, and, and, and walk hand in hand, you know. <laughs> Joe Smooth's experience on the DJ International Tour inspired what was to become a house anthem. When Joe Smooth hit the stage, it was, it was, I could see, I can remember Joe's face as it was yesterday. He came on, I'm trying to remember the venue, we're up north, Huddersfield or something, and there had to be 3,000 people in front of him. And he walked on and it was like, boo, 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 and there's Joe Smooth in promised land and he sang into the chorus and everyone knew the words. And here's someone who had just come out of Chicago, he couldn't get arrested with his record, it wasn't on any playlist, maybe two playlists out of 1400 in the states and here he is and he's a household name and girls are throwing themselves on stage. The song itself is like taking the basic element from the Martin Luther King speech and just expounding upon it on a musical level. Remember the same time as Joe Smooth. This is an art. This is a great irony. The same week, the same month, the same day as Joe Smooth had the track "Promised Land" on the streets. The Style Council released a cover of "Promised Land." Brothers, sisters, If the Style Council hadn't released, we would have gone, without question, top five, maybe number one. But because, again, the might of the majors, they're buying this piss-poor imitation, you know, of, 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 of a great classic. I don't, I don't think there is another version that maybe would capture the emotion and the feeling behind the song, the way the original version does. We had the white artist adopting, almost, almost hijacking a sound because they knew it was the sound of tomorrow. Ibiza played a huge part in, in the club culture that we, that we know today. Really because of the style of, of clubbing really, I think, that was, that was brought back from Ibiza into London. I only ever been in discos where you sit down and like sit in chewing gum and it's all like you know kind of all doom and gloom and and um and it was like this beautiful open air like big garden of eden and you mixing it up so he had a mixed crowd there and i think all he was trying to do was just you know play a mixture of quality dance music you know and still slip in some of the new things that he was into, which was Chicago house sound. We'd obviously also all been introduced into like, you know, taking a, taking an E. There was like sweat on their brow and their hairs was all like dishevelled and they were like, what the fuck is going on here, you know? I remember seeing Paul, Paul Oakenfold and I think Nicky Holloway skipping around the club hand in hand, which they might, they might deny now. I don't think that it was a necessity and I don't think that everybody was doing it. I just think E 
was something that um, brought the people together in as much as it made them appreciate the music. As their holiday ended, the four friends resolved to bring their summer back to London. In the autumn of 1987, Danny Rampling recreated Ibiza in a gym in Southwark. He called it... You can barely see this far in front of you. Danny Rampling was like there. Danny Rampling on the decks. It's like, oh, it's Danny Rampling, it's Danny Rampling, it's Danny Rampling. Now, some girl told me once afterwards that she could see his aura as he DJ'd. These people who, like, you were just like, it was like, oh my God, you know, they were in Gaultier suits one week, and next minute they were, like, very spiritual in. Uh, on my mateys, they say. London was finally catching on to the joys of Chicago House. Unless you were on it, it was the difference between the lights being on or not off. I mean, you were in a, you were in a fitness club, but as soon as you'd get sorted, you were in amnesia. All these fresh-faced people completely, you know, mashed on drugs. But because they hadn't been doing it for years, they, they looked quite healthy, really. And even the gurning looked quite attractive. <laughs> People were getting down there. They were, they were taking loads of ecstasy. They were wearing loads of day-glow clothing. And they were all going absolutely mad. I hate to say it, but before Shum, the, the, the music didn't have an identity. You know, it didn't, have a, it didn't have a look. It didn't have a dance. The whole culture of dance music and rave culture, you can say its beginnings were at Shum. House had arrived, but the music was still being driven by America. In Chicago, producer Marshall Jefferson was about to create its very first supergroup. Did a couple records under the name uh, Ragtime, and uh, when Atlantic Records uh, approached us about doing recording for them, they said that they wanted uh, us to record for them, but they hated the name Ragtime. <laughs> so he was looking for a group name, and I said, oh, in, in, intense, tense, intensity. He said, oh, oh, this stuff that we're doing, man, this stuff is so intense. I'm telling you, this is intense. I can feel the energy. That's, that's my Marshall impersonation. The way Byron was singing, you know, as a, you know, he was, do extreme highs and lows. I start messing around with the name Intensity and I took the IN off of the um, front off of it and came up with Ten City, which I thought sounded a, a lot cooler. And then also I was sort of into numerology and things like that at the time. And I thought it was like, well, 10 is uh, symbolic as the number of, uh, of perfection. Ten City, where everything is perfect, you know, to, to, and like. You know, that's where Byron took it, because he was like a deep guy like that. Two people take a vow to be together And live and love each other forever They promise to love a lifetime Funny thing, then they change their minds Marshall, when he was producing those records, was... He was doing live strings, you know, he was doing... Yeah, he was shit, bringing out, he was know, definitely bringing out the live. Live bass and all that, and he was, he was making them records, they were hot. Sometimes he would do things in such a way, I guess it would be like Picasso, he would do things to me and it would sound, sound like strange, I mean, just really bizarre. And, and so sometimes it, it wouldn't all come together until it was actually done and you would go, oh yeah. No longer just about simple drum loops and raw samples, house was real music. He hired 16 people to do hand claps. <laughs> yeah, he was like... When he, he was blew, doing the whole live he thing? He blew the whole budget on hand claps or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> if I just want all my samples to sound different, man, it's nothing special, you know.
In nearby Detroit, House was about to give birth to its angry sibling, Techno. We were focused in, man. We were like Shaolin monks or something when it came to music. You know, we were focused, we were locked in from the very, before the beginning, I guess you could say. Techno brought an intellectual theory to dance music. Michael James comes to my house. He wants to, he's a friend of mine from around the corner. He just wants to, wow, you got keyboards. I just want to sit down and make some music. Can I do that? Is it okay? Yeah, fine, go ahead. He starts to mess around with the piano. He plays piano wonderfully. And he's playing this ballad thing. He did it for, I don't know, hours and I sequenced it for him and he split. I, I just listened to it and I heard one particular part out of it that sounded really interesting. So I, I just did an edit uh, and I just looped this one particular part of the sequence. And uh, from there, I, I just went on to do strings. I was scared of strings. I was scared of that track when I did it. I was completely naked in my house for a whole day. Just walking around my house naked, looking out the window, you know, at the, at like this cityscape, and just listening to this track. I don't know, I was tripping. But I, I never did drugs, but I felt like I was on drugs, man. There was a guy in Chicago, in Chicago one time that said to me, he said, uh, listen, he was in a record shop. He said, I don't know if I should dance to that or if I should waltz, you know. And that was the reason it was there for me because uh, I was trying to put, I was trying to show the sort of sophistication of dance music. Strings of Life classic made by someone who had a vision of, of the future in the sense of, of what the machines could do if you allowed them to rock in this way. Euphoric yet futuristic, you know, yet Detroit techno. It, it truly was a masterpiece. And you couldn't really categorise it either. It, it wasn't house, it wasn't techno, it was just Derek May. I said, oh, well, if you can imagine Kraftwerk and George Clinton stuck in the elevator with one keyboard between them, you know, and you got George on the left and you got Kraftwerk on the right. That was the concept, you know, as if they're stuck in this elevator for hours and when it finally opens, you know, out comes this sort of, you know, funky metal smell, you know, and the keyboard is sort of flipped inside out and, you know, that was it. In the summer of 88, Big Fun thrust techno into the UK charts. Paul Okafor was playing it at uh, it was a Monday night at Heaven. It was during the acid period, when the, the summer of acid, I don't know what they call it, but it, it was, uh, you know, a good vibe, and then he played Big Fun, and it just was amazing. Detroit's techno joined Chicago House in Britain as the soundtrack of what was to become the Summer of Love. It was really about that time and people just sing it from the rafters, they would just be singing it from the top of their voices, but they have that driving techno sound to it. Everyone was just living this lifestyle, it was so quick and changing every week. It's just people gave up their jobs, they gave up their wives, their lives, they gave up everything. You couldn't go to work on a Tuesday morning, you know, you're better off outside the South African Embassy singing Free Nelson Mandela. I used to DJ at Spectrum um, till four in the morning and I was still in the gas bulb, you know, putting meters in the back of my car to go and fit them. No one could stop it. You know, it was to do with us and what we were creating. Only, I think, when Paul Okafold asked me to do Future, that I thought, well, I can't possibly stay up two nights a week and fit gas meters safely <laughs> without killing someone, you know, blowing some poor old deer up. It was like an explosion of ideas, you know, people were writing poetry, you know, bricklayers. 
coming in showing you bits of poetry. Voodoo Ray was the, the soundtrack for 88 for Monkey Indians. I was just picturing like some having like this big opening like a and then like bam. In the summer of 88, Big Fun thrust techno into the UK charts. Paul Okafor was playing it at uh, it was a Monday night at Heaven. It was during the acid period, when this, this summer of acid, I don't know what they call it, but it, it was, uh, you know, a good vibe. And then he played Big Fun, and it just was amazing. Detroit's techno joined Chicago House in Britain as the soundtrack of what was to become the Summer of Love. It was really about that time and people would just sing it from the rafters, they would just be singing it from the top of their voices, but they have that driving techno sound to it. Everyone was just living this lifestyle, it was so quick and changing every week. It's just people gave up their jobs, they gave up their wives, their lives, they gave up everything. You couldn't go to work on a Tuesday morning, you know, you're better off outside the South African Embassy singing Free Nelson Mandela. I used to DJ at Spectrum um, till four in the morning and I was still at the gas board, you know, putting meters in the back of my car to go and fit them. No one could stop it. You know, it was to do with us and what we were creating. Only, I think, when Paul Okafold asked me to do Future that I thought, well, I can't possibly stay up two nights a week and fit gas meters safely <laughs> without killing someone, you know, blowing some poor old deer up. It was like an explosion of ideas, you know, people were writing poetry, you know, bricklayers, coming in showing you bits of poetry. Voodoo Ray was the, the soundtrack for 88 for Monkey Indians. I was just picturing like some having like this big opening like a and then like BAM! It wasn't a song as such, it was just a groove. Do do that's like that's the killer part really. That old that classic early house. Thing of a bloke just chanting something which was voodoo ray, voodoo ray. And you'd had a pill, and then there was this, you know, <laughs> going over it, and then boing, 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 and oh! you know what I mean, and that was it. Gerald Simpson's masterpiece was designed with one club in mind, the Hacienda. Uh, yeah, Gerald, Gerald was hanging out, hanging around the club, you know, um, we tried to get rid of him, but he, just, he kept coming back. Gerald used to come, Gerald Simpson used to come on Friday nights from off, early 80s, you know, like 84. And he arrived at DJ Box, you know, at some point or other with a copy of Voodoo Ray. I'm sure I just heard my tune, like a bit of it, and then like, he came in. Oh, fucking hell, he's playing it. Oh, yeah, I can't believe it. And then like, everyone started cheering, I was like, Oh shit, what, what's going on here? You know, so I ran upstairs to the DJ box and I'm like, oh, cheers, we played it. I looked down and everyone was like, I'm going off. I'm like, wow, cool. <laughs> you know, the sound wasn't always fantastic in the house because it was a concrete building. But uh, yeah, Voodoo Ray always sounded absolutely brilliant. As Voodoo Ray dominated clubs throughout the UK, the Hacienda opened a new night. Hots, I think the first night was July the 13th, 88. And someone said, fuck me man, go and check out the, your Wednesday nights, 
stunning. But it was a sort of a Ibiza thing. We had the swimming pool. A ludicrous idea. <laughs> Can you imagine with all the, the, the glasses and, you know, people diving in and out? There was blood everywhere. Some of the doormen were the lifeguards and uh, they had tables with the sun canopies on, you know, like you're outside in the sun. Um, they were giving out ice pops when you walked in. I walked through the door, 10.30, the next Wednesday night, and I look around in shock. Like a, like a you know, thundering train hit the Hacienda. I remember one night standing in there and thinking, I really wouldn't rather be anywhere else in the whole world but standing right here, right now, in this, in this place. Too strong. Check this out. We had 2,500 people in there a night doing this and are going for it. I came out of the DJ box, you know, several weeks into July. I uh, was just almost scared. It was exhilarating. It was just, just, the, just to feel the energy in the place. There was a corner called E Corner, but to be, to be frank with you, once ecstasy set in at the Hacienda, the whole place was, you know, he took the E, and because nobody at that time knew what it did to you, you didn't think he was doing anything wrong. You didn't think fucking six people in the corner all getting, you know, the dick sucked and sucking birds' tits was anything, you know, anything. It just seemed normal. Enjoy this trip. Enjoy this trip. And it is a trip. House was about to hit the high street. Countdown is progressing. One, two, three, four, five, The trip spawned 1,500 new ravers every week. One time when I was there, we left the club and everybody was so high you know not high on drugs just high on that that whole night we all poured out of the club all of a sudden you had 1500 people out on the street not wanting to leave the buzz of the night and of course the road would get blocked they'd be jumping in the, sh the fountains and the showers and a couple of people turn up and turn the music up in the cars and before you know it, you had this massive street party going on <laughs> I can believe that that was the power of what was going on. Hundreds of day glow acid Teds in central London didn't go unnoticed. I think the big kind of sea change was a handful of clubs added to another handful of headlines in the sun equals pandemonium. They help fuel, they help make it get bigger. You couldn't control it. Once it was out of the bag, it was out of the bag. I'm sure that lots of people probably never heard about what was going on until they read about it in the daily newspapers and thought, oh, we'll have to have some of that. So all of a sudden, everybody in the country wanted to get onto the kind of acid bandwagon. As the tabloids fueled demand, acid parties exploded across the southeast. <laughs> These words were illegal. Um, you couldn't give, actually give out the address. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the looking for the party was, was, was probably the best bit for a lot of people. You'd probably turn up at a kind of uh, the corner of a street somewhere in Bethnal Green. So they said, right, I can't tell you exactly where it's going to be, but take this mobile phone number, get ready, bring your driver, bring your people with you, whatever you need on that sort of night, and head off to this particular place. And you'd go to the phone box in M25, and then you'd get a number, and then you'd phone, and they'd tell you where it was happening. Right, 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 you've made it to the pub. Now get yourselves over to this certain, like, next village or something. And you'd know you were getting there. The traffic was slowed down. You know? There'd be kind of gaggles of people hanging out of car windows, throwing bottles of Evian at each other. 
sort of pull up in our car with me in the back, the two dancers, the driver and his boyfriend. We say, oh, it's kinky, like we're playing tonight, we're doing that E-track. And people like traipsing one way or another, here in the, you know, here and there, in the dark, you know, very um, protected from the elements, you know, without torches or anything necessarily. And they'd get there. And, you know, it was really like sunrise, you know, kind of like... S and a D coming in like love, sex and danger. Drop a tab of E and make a rub up with a stranger. Now bother vex your mind and feel say, Lord, it might derange you. Buck up on some one love, make this fantasy go on, take you. <laughs> Everything starts with an E prompted a rapid reaction from Radio 1. A radio on BBC Bandit and they said, you know, due to its um, lyrical content and they said it was inciting the youth of, t of today to consume drugs. <laughs> My argument was, you know, it's a kind of social documentary commentary on the situation going on. As Acid House took over the nation, the papers fueled a moral panic. These young people, when they came to dance, didn't come with tents. They used to come just in their shirts and their slacks, and the young girls in almost nothing and uh, they would be laying all over these fields here. The, the music was deafening. We've got ferris wheels in the main field over there and all the fairground attractions plus the music and over here of course is the cricket ground um, where they parked the vehicles and created all that damage to the pitch itself. If I was to say that there was about a thousand people in this village uh, which was swelled by at least another 20,000 between a Friday evening and a Sunday afternoon, um, one will get the idea and the perspective of uh, a fairly sleepy, typical English village being turned into almost a dump with drugs, music that carried over four miles, people urinating on front lawns, uh, and uh, worse than that, uh, you'll get the picture how villagers felt, how the local parish council felt, and definitely how the uh, greenkeeper of this lovely, lovely uh, cricket ground must have been beside himself. Throughout the summer of 88, every weekend another 10,000 kids lost it in fields beside the M25. Most of the original people on the scene look down their noses at that kind of stuff. We used to sort of, you know, coat that scene off terribly, you know, it was all Judge Jules playing 15 gigs a night and uh, so nothing's changed. I think it carried on the torch of just this kind of innocence and this kind of freedom of expression and not caring about, you know, the rules. It was just a mass money-making thing, you know, controlled by villains. Well, the first big party I ever played at, I saw, like, big bags of cash and drugs and sawn off shotguns but that was just over there and it was more interesting what was going on over there with like 8,000 day glow people jumping up and down. So I went from like playing to 30 people to 8,000 within a couple of weeks. Some kid came up to me and said, you know, that track you played with the bass line changed my life. So I, I called um, one of my tracks, the bass line changed my life. And, um, and I called another track, Energy, after that party. I wouldn't credit myself with innovations. I mean, I was just a cog in the wheel, really. As the nation raved through another summer of love in 89, the police stepped up the pressure. We were getting up to 246 parties in the region a week. 
we'd have two of everything. We'd have two venues, two sound systems, two lighting crews, and if one didn't happen, we just go to another one. Simple as that. I then had to resort to tactics that probably were not totally legal, but were somewhat effective. The police were following us everywhere. They'd be following us, they'd be following all the people that worked for us, they'd be following the sound guys, they'd arrest the sound guys, the lighting guys. Tomorrow could see the beginning of the end of acid house parties. With the police seemingly powerless, in 1990, Tory MP Graham Bright entered the fray. Graham Bright, the MP for Luton South, is bringing in a private member's bill, which could result in organisers being jailed and their equipment seized. But making the parties illegal only attracted more criminals. Uh, I was kidnapped uh, uh, three times. Um, by three different groups. So, you know, I had shotguns in my mouth, and you know, which was very, very, very scary. You know, on, on that particular occasion, I've got to admit, I cried my eyes out. <laughs> I think, in a way, we failed because we drove it underground. And when we drove it underground, there was far more dangers, and there was far more thuggery, and there was extortion. We're only trying to do some parties, and that's what I would say to them. You know, well, we're only trying to do some parties, man. Yeah, you know, it's no big deal. I think there was a kind of unconscious reaction to the idea that Margaret, Th Margaret Thatcher had propagated that there is no society. And I think people created their own societies unwittingly in defiance of that statement. It was great to see how, how it kind of broke down all, all social barriers and but racial barriers as well in the sense of, you know, we wanted to dance to one kick drum and this is it, bang. During that time, it was when we named ourselves, was when they used to be all those big London orbital raves where you'd drive around the sort of Potter's Bar service station, bringing up a secret number and finding out where the next rave was. And they were sort of marching around the M25 towards us until one appeared about two miles away from our front door, which was crap, actually. It was a crap <laughs> party. Absolute rubbish in a big cow tunnel. <laughs> Inspired by Chicago House, Detroit Techno and the M25 rave scene, Orbital's chimes signaled Britain's total mastery of the new dance music. Yeah, I can turn that on and off and that brings that sound in and out. These are MMTHs, these are what we use live. They're basically little hardware sequencers. They work in a system of each machine has eight loops, eight different pieces of music if you like that they all loops around in time, but then each machine has a hundred of these groups of eight. This is all sort of going around, I might think, let's have some drums. And let's change the sequence at the same time. So I'll push that along. And there we are into another part of the song, you know. This is, this is going around, it's a different pattern now. Hence the different tune. Might do something like this, put the bass line in, take the drums out and then sort of prepare myself for the something a bit bigger and bring all the drums back in and there we go, shine in a, in a live fashion so you pause place that on there it's got the sampler playing that and then I've got the mixing desk and you can then you know you can mess around with the, the sound I sort of played it to Jazzy M and he, his eyes nearly popped out of his head. It was quite unique and it was a unique sounding tune. It had all the kind of acidy twitterings in it, reverse strings. You know, Matt, it was just a great record, very, very original. He was listening to it on headphones and he was selling all these records on a Friday evening to all the DJs and he said, look, I can't play it out loud, I've got to, you know, be selling people things. And he listened to it and went, hang on a minute, whipped his records off and played it and just like stood there laughing. And all these people going, oh, I'll have one of them, oh, I'll have one of them, oh yeah, I'll have one of them. And all these DJs asking for it saying, you can't have it, it's a tape. The only way to actually cut that record was from that cassette which I did. But we, it actually we, came out slow because I recorded it on my dad's tape deck which actually ran slightly fast so it's actually like a couple of BPM slower than it was supposed to be. When we actually licensed it to double F double R because Pete Tong uh, went after it um, to sign it up to save kind of face and embarrassment we actually we put the cassette onto a DAT, a digital audio tape to actually then sell to him so it wouldn't look too cheap. <laughs>
that's the greatest example of how you know it all goes right from signing a 12 inch record that ends up being a 10 year career and they're on their seventh album that was the actual ozone logo there and um this is the only um tp as you can see chime 122 deeper the b-site if you got some i've got one yeah i don't know even know where i got one of these they're worth 50 quid now <laughs> it's like jesus i wish i had a packet full of those i don't think anyone's ever ever got close to them you know and that chime record was just so different and to see those two guys standing on top of the pops doing absolutely initial when all around was like Rick Astley or whatever it was on at the time, I can't remember as well. And they were just standing there like, dun, 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 you know, it was just like brilliant and it was tops. By the end of the 80s, the house music of America had effected a massive social and cultural revolution in Britain. Over the next 10 years, it was to show no sign of stopping. Come on. You know, you're in New York, you don't, you don't ever think about going to another country, to the other side of the world, and hearing people loving the same music that you love. Yeah, we were filled on drugs, yeah, it was all fuck, it was off our tits. Going fucking ballistic, but that's what it was about. There was a time when there wasn't a term house music or techno music or warehouse or garage or happy house or all this other shit it was just music what we're gonna do right here is go back back back, back. in the late 80s house in america was still an underground music in the country of its birth radio stations were firmly segregated and played either rock country and western or r b and hip-hop if you liked up-tempo dance music, house music, you had to go to a club to hear it. House is a big part of club culture today, you know, and for the last, what, 15 years. music all of it wasn't on the radio you know but this was a scene that was developing all around the world you know uh, that started in Chicago and New York um, it's just a feeling in the clubs that you get from these driving tracks these great tracks great songs great feelings great some of them had great lyrics they weren't all instrumentals I remember every person in the club vocally responding to records Imagine that. Imagine being a club, even if it's like 500 people. When everybody's vocally responding to ev almost every song that DJ plays, that's energy, man. At clubs like the Paradise Garage in New York, DJs were making converts to the house scene. But I had a friend that turned me on to it. He was a house head. So he would have all these people over there that hated house, but he'd be playing it, and he'd be jacking, you know, dancing like, move your body, rock. He just was looking at him like, said it's retarded. And it took me a long time. It took me like late 88 for me to really start getting into house. But I caught on to Todd Terry. Known to his fans as God, Todd Terry brought a hard-hitting hip-hop sensibility to the basic house sound. It was like, I like house now. I only like Todd, but I like house. It was just energizing. It was just like, dude, your cats would be just bug into it, you know? So that was like, that was my introduction to house. Gritty, raw, in your face house. I used to see guys, I thought they were gonna rip off their dreads. They were like on the floor like, like this, like almost to the point in tears, over a record. No drugs, you know what I mean? That's house. Todd Terry's quick-fire samples and rugged bass lines forged a blueprint for House that's still being followed today. Most 
people's style, even like if you want to look at who's hot, like Daft Punk or like anybody that Disco Loops, Todd did that first too. So Disco Looping, Todd did that first. Um, let me put a rock sample on a house beat. Oh, Todd did that already too. Um, you know, it's not, not much left Todd hasn't done. While Todd was undoubtedly a pioneer, it was only on the other side of the Atlantic that House had a mainstream audience. Over in the UK, by the end of 1989, House was top of the pops. styles what were, the, what were the skies like when you were young they went on forever they, when I we lived in Arizona and the skies always had little fluffy clouds in them. ambient house mixed down temple beats to new age and, and, and when it rain, it turned, it, they were beautiful the most beautiful skies as a matter of fact uh, the sunsets were Purple. Club DJs found this pretty quick in the late 80s with acid out. You couldn't really play a whole vocal because people would just come down and they'd think they're listening to Radio 1 or something, you know. So they'd have to play the instrumentals, and but every now and again a tiny bit of vocal, either sung or a little bit of spoken word, would just give you a kind of little rope from the heavens to say, okay, this is something to look at. just play rainforest sounds over old ambient music and then spin in some Marshall Jefferson or some of my house stuff as well uh, and create a whole evening of seamless ambience you know the orbs little fluffy clouds introduced chilling out to the rave generation And so we just put it together and suddenly, you know, it sounded just great, you know. A lot of people came up to me afterwards, a couple, would, say, would run up to me and say, well, who did that? That's the most beautiful voice I've ever heard in the world. Where is she? You know, who, where can I meet her? And I think what part of the fun of the record was that finding out that it was Ricky Lee Jones was the last person you'd expect it to be. It's not Chucky's in love, is it? The most unlikely take on House was to be the kids from Salford formed a band, and um, the fact that they were to change history. I don't think people are conscious that they're going to do that. I don't think Elvis Presley was conscious he was going to do what he was going to do. You know, he just did what he did, and they just did what they did. Formed in Manchester in the mid '80s, the Happy Mondays started life as a typical indie rock band. At the time. In Little Oton, which is part, you know, like an overspill of Salford, they built the most used, gigantic superstar, right, called Scam. It sold everything from the sports goods 
you know, to guitars, to amplifiers, to records, to food, right? But basically, they had it set up like a fucking greengrocer's. A mirror there, a mirror there, and fucking 20 old ditties on the till. We used to go shopping with her mum and dad, right, and we purposely put our fishtail parkers on. That's down there. It's all there, right? Air guns down in that, in your lining. They had these country and western amps in, right, which was fucked. And you could literally get away with carrying these things out. But it was during the recording of their second album, Bummed, that the Mondays started to absorb the twin influences of house music and ecstasy. 20 or 30 of our friends had come down to this little club. So we gave the DJ some new records to play, right? Put a pill down his neck and we we're all dancing like this and having a great time. And then there's all these squaddies. And all looking like that. What's your fucking mate looking at? And why are you dancing like that? You taking the piss? So, me and another pal of ours, I won't mention his name, uh, said to this guy, Look, just put one of them in your mouth. And in an hour's time, right? Just trust us. In an hour's time, you'll enjoy yourself and there'll be no fighting and you'll be dancing like us. He, he ends up scrounging like about 30 pills for all his squaddy mates. So two hours later, we've got all these squaddies in this thing doing this, you know, and dancing and going, saying, this is the best thing. I don't want to go back in the army and all that lot. So there we are in Driffield and I drove over there, but in between that and finding all these squaddies looking for the Mondays in the local pub, I finally find the studio in this courtyard and go in the recording room and there's Martin Hannett recording a wonderful rock track, God knows which one. And then I go across the courtyard to what is normally where, where musicians play pool and hang out and drink coffee and get bored. And all I could hear was <laughs> coming out of this space and there was no lights on. I remember opening the door and it was pitch dark and stumbling over bodies and lots and lots of black vinyl. And Across the way, they were recording this rock album, but in this room, they were all lying on the floor, out of their heads, just playing this, this weird, obscure, American imported house music. To put a house beat into their indie rock, the Mondays brought a DJ into the studio. Rope for Luck was, was just... The way I approach that mix is what works on the dance floor. None of us really knew how it was going to turn out. I knew what I wanted. I knew that the rhythms in rock records never worked. So it had to be more rhythmic, especially the bottom end. Um, so it was all about changing the B line and the drums. So basically we took a loop from NWA, looped it up, got Ryder's vocals up and, and worked on a groove and it went from there. Well, what he brought to it, right, was he brought that sort of trance to it. Do you know what I mean? Where, you know, you, you, you couldn't, you didn't have to, well, the boom, you know, you could give it all, all that and things, you know what I mean? And, and even do cartwheels and things, you know, and things like that. He brought that smooth mellowness, everything to it, that all the right ingredients. When you've got the trust that, that Sean and the boys gave us, and the vision that we had, it, it, it just it just worked. It wasn't something that you sat down and tried to work out why it worked. There was a vibe, and the vibe was a good vibe. And plus, we didn't have a clue. You know, if you'd have shown me a mixing desk, then, you know, I've, I'd have thought you cut sheet metal on it. The Mondays led an explosion in indie dance music and took house to a whole new audience. Think about the future, the future. And I'm quoting the Delhi Telegraph here, 
the drummer and bass player of the Mondays changed British music by adapting the house rhythms of Chicago to British rock, punk, indie or whatever. They were the synthesizers. They were the people who... In a I listened to house music in 85 and 86 and, and at that time house music could be anything, you know, it was like acid was house music, if it had an 808 beat and a more of electronic feel, it was house music, if it had a soulful vocal and a piano chords in it, that was house music, you know, and I liked that, I liked where I could jump around a little bit and go work with my moods, you know, I had many moods, I was happy one day, some days I was depressed, you know, by the time I was like 19 and, and well into making records, all that really didn't interest me, I still was like 19 and being rebellious, I didn't want to do music that was popular, I wanted to do music that was cool, underground, and you know represented me and you know you know the youth or whatever you know but i still thought i was making house music <laughs> i thought the track was done it needs one other element something to put on top of it Eventually, I came across this record, this sample, it's an ecstasy, and I was just like, wow, that works with the track. But because of the time, because of the feel of the track, because it was a darker house record, which became techno or whatever, people were like, ecstasy, you know, that's, that's a drug record, that's a drug anthem, he means ecstasy, you know, the drug or whatever. I don't think anybody expected for Joey to come out of, uh, out the way he did. And Energy Flash was some, was some other shit. You know, it was really some other shit. It was like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It was a nice track, though. It still is today. I think that broke the back of a lot of things. You know, it was just so different. I think for me, it was hearing it for the first time about seven in the morning at, at sort of as close as we can get to Stonehenge, Stonehenge Krusty Festival thing, the Spiral Tribe. Um, and I was just about, I was saying, right, I'm going to go to my tent now, I've had enough. And the sun was coming up and someone just started playing that. And I just thought, what the hell is that? And it just sounded like how I felt, do you know what I mean? This crazy sound. It was just, I can't believe this record. It's so hard and, and mad and, you know. Great, brilliant records. I mean, even people, I know people that even aren't in, into house music or techno have heard that and gone, what's this, this record's mad. And that's like 10 years after it was released. Energy Flash redefined the limits of dance music. But its dark minimalism and brooding intensity was too much for the house scene. I guess maybe I was disillusioned because, you know, I guess in England they just said, no, this is techno, son, you're making techno records, and we're going to call you techno, we're going to sell you stuff, we're going to like it, whatever, but as long as you have that techno label affixed to you, you know? But, you know, I thought I was making house music, you know? I just thought I was making house music, but with a different edge. Too hardcore for New York, Beltram found his spiritual home in Europe. Clubs like Rage in London, House was getting harder, darker. DJs pitched records up on their decks to increase the tempo. It was about fucking just getting down, getting nuts. Do you know what I mean? That's what it was about. People going fucking mental. That's all this club was about. And yeah, we were filled on drugs. Yeah, it was all fuck. It was off our tits, going fucking ballistic. But that's what it was about. When I played at Rage for the first time, well, the atmosphere. That was the first place I ever saw with a laser. That was just like, took up, swallowed up the whole dance floor. It was just absolutely mad. This is fucking laser going mental on people's heads. Just walking in the energy and the vibe and everything. It was crazy. Fucking everyone's got the shirts off going absolutely fucking mental, you know what I mean? On these podiums going crazy. And I thought, fucking hell, this is intense. You know, you had it from, from models to, to hippies to students to stockbrokers. We're just all in there, just, you know, loving the music. Because it was like, you saw black people, white people, and it was just like, it was... It was just raving, whistling, shaking, there was horns going off, and it was like a football match, I mean. Hardcore. It wasn't just a sound, but a whole attitude. Because I was like there, always trying to think, oh, what, I'm going to design a fucking tune, I've got to do the tune, this is going to fuck people up. You know, I'll be fucking drumming easy and like fucking five a night, I'll be fucking off my tits. So, what, well, guys, I'm buzzing, let's make music. 
So I mean, I had this tune last night, I had this, I had this. And you, you start fucking around and things start coming out. The thing you can't forget, the instinctive thing, all I wanted the people to do was dance. <laughs> I EQ Terminator on about five E's and I was standing on the fucking desk on the roof. Like... Remember the first time I played the tune, I was like, fuck it now. My fucking hair went like a whap straight up and I remember I just closed my eyes and I was fucking buzzing up my nut. I just came up with about two eddies. I felt this, this whole fuck, I felt like I am the fucking king of this club, right? And I just felt this warm beam across me. You're talking about things that I haven't done yet. People didn't know what the fuck was going on. I was like, what the fuck is this? It was just like bending people's fucking prisms open. You know? I was like, what the fuck is that? I didn't know what I'd done. I didn't realise what I'd done. Goldie took hardcore's breakbeat and hammered it into a whole new sound. Drum and bass. I don't want it to be about my mother, or about Timeless, or about, you know what I mean, a select piece of music. It was just about making people fucking dance. That's, that's it. The sound was getting, like, really dark and, like, heavy. Tempos um, started to speed up a little. Um, and it just got, like, a lot more sophisticated than, than it was. It wasn't just like really simple kind of dub B lines anymore. We started like to get more into like the synthesis of like the, the bass lines and like it wasn't just like sampling a hip hop break and speeding it up anymore. It was actually using like samples like chopped up and loops, reversing them and the whole process basically got like a lot more sophisticated. I've seen Derek, man. I met him previously before that. Like, That's the guy that did Strings of Life. Oh, fuck. Fuck. And always in the back of my mind was I'm gonna fucking freak that guy out. Because I always wanted to freak out the guys that were making the fucking music. And I remember saying, I said to him, Look, Derek, I wanna play you something in the car. But I don't need to fucking get out of the car. He said, What do you mean? It's like, What do you fucking mean? I said, well, it's like 20 fucking two minutes long. You know what I mean? So he's like, well, What? I'm like, It's 22 minutes long. It's like, I said, But you can't, you can't speak though. I just wanna play this in here. So I sat in the, in the car and I just fucking pressed play and I thought, fucking see you later. Inner city life took drum and bass into realms of sophistication, previously unthought of. He came in, came into my office. He sat down in front and said, what do you want? I said, oh yeah, you're good. <laughs> so, because, of course I'm fucking good. What do you want? <laughs> he was really aggressive. And then uh, he sort of threw this cassette at me. And I didn't know what I was going to get. And I had to sit there for 20 minutes, 22 minutes to be precise and listen to Inner City Life. And I said, right, where do, we, where do I sign? Goldie's debut album, Timeless, catapulted drum and bass out of the clubs and into the charts. When I met Goldie, I was more—I was probably as excited about him as a, as a sort of star as I was about his music. I mean, I was knocked out by his music, but I really did think, you know, that my time had come. That you know, after say not signing Soul to Soul or Nana Cherry or whatever, this was the next one to come along that could be a truly international mega star. No matter what happens, I will never make another piece like Timeless. I will never make, you know. Timeless will always be the best drum bass album ever. You will never ever beat that album. The government, meanwhile, had been drafting legislation aimed at controlling rave culture. 
Amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill in 1994 defined a rave as anything more than a hundred people listening to amplified music characterized by the emission of successive repetitive beats. Not since Oliver Cromwell's Sunday observance laws had Parliament tried to stop people dancing. For the first time I think people felt like, yeah, this is our land, this is our country, and we want to party, and why not? And who's to say that we shouldn't do that? And if they are, why are they saying that? And who's this thing called the state saying, you're not allowed to have fun, and you can't go into a field and dance all night if you want to? It's so basically a yeah, prerequisite of human uh, experience and prerequisite of human right, I would have thought. Ravers and Krusties forged an alliance to fight for their right to party. I've got to stand and fight in this creation. Vanity, I know, can't hide I alone. I'm searching to find a love that lasts all time. Despite protests, the Criminal Justice Bill became law in November 1994. Of course, it did nothing to stop house music's evolution. Dance music was always viewed as a faceless entity, wasn't it? Left field didn't really want to be seen. You know, they, they didn't want the fame, but they knew that they had to bring it to a live stage and a live standard. It was like, you know, we just want to rock you, and that was the difference. And they pulled it off live. And a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of bands still don't do that now. You know, they they do a lot to play back and play bits live. Left field played live. They had a drummer. They, had, you know, it, it it was brilliant. It's brilliant. Resisting the fame, the love that lasts all time. Left field drew on house, techno, and dub to create a distinctly British sound. Neil was a massive reggae fan, more than me. He had a lot of history with reggae. It wasn't a dance record, it was just more a bit of an experiment, really, with a few beats and, like, it was an unusual tempo again, it was like 110 BPM, it wasn't really prime time kind of dance music, you know. But we knew it was our own sound, so we just went ahead and we released it on our own label, Hard Hands. Musically, nothing else was sounding like left field. You know, a lot of it was kind of sounding a bit aboriginal and there was all mad sounds like Ouija this and wobbly that and, you know, just so different, so original, so groundbreaking. Got what they deserve, basically. Can't say enough good about them. They are my idols. And in 1993, they pulled off one of House's most audacious acts of assimilation. I think it's probably one of the best records we ever made, definitely, you know. It was it was something. And, it, and we knew it was different, because it was it had all these influences of techno, world music, dub, with John Lydon on. The granddaddy of punk, John Lydon, stamped his unique endorsement on UK House. We wanted to do something different and um, we'd always talked about doing a track with John and we had a kind of a demo of a track which we sent over to John and, and he just sort of rang us back and said, where's the fucking chorus sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying people, I've just done a track with John Lydon. People going, really? Like that sort of thing, you know. So I suppose people couldn't imagine what it would be like. 
and then a few people came down the studio, I played it to them and, and they were just blown away, you know, and I knew then that we had something good and we got a great performance out of John. It was the record that crossed us over into mainstream pop music, I suppose, for want of better words, you know. It was a record suddenly that if you weren't into dance music, but you liked punk or you liked rock music, you could suddenly get into this, but it had a groove. Left Field proved that by the mid-90s, the UK had well and truly made house music its own. I mean, where Paul Daly gets that bass from, I do not know. In its spiritual homeland, the music was coming out of the darkness. Producers like Masses at Work had finally put house into the US charts. We were getting really pop-oriented records. We said, let's take the B-sides and just put our style of music on it. Strictly going for it, you know, going for rock in the clubs. You know, we took a couple of vocal samples from, you know, the, the, the song from the artist or whatever and put it on the B-side and called them Masters That Work Dubs. So we just wanted people to feel our vibes and that's how it started. Next thing you know, like Frankie Knuckles was playing a Debbie Gibson record and he would never play a Debbie Gibson record, but that B-side was so strong, that dub, and he loved it. He loved the whole vibe. Masters at Work's remixing of pop stars like Mick Hucknall into club floor fillers sealed the supremacy of the DJ as a studio producer. They didn't even want the house mix. That's what I'm saying. It was just a remix. And, and we just ended up doing that dub, and they put it on the B side, and that's what started the whole, the whole thing. But they didn't, they didn't know what the hell house music was. Ow! For DJs, it had always been a short step from mixing records in a club to remixing them in a studio. Now the major record companies were calling on them to bring a big club feel to pale chart pop. When I did Torino, it was like a lot. I think it was bug people out the most because it was not like anything I've done. I didn't know who she was. Never heard of her. And um, the guy's just like, I'm like, how much is it? Okay, do I have time? Okay. It was just kind of like that regular ordeal. It wasn't like anything special, except for he said one thing to me. He's like, he's like, I really want you to do something different. Armin Van Helden's pumped up remix of Tori Amos was a massive crossover hit. Big in both the clubs and charts in the US and UK, it cemented house music's domination of pop. I was like, that's a rock guy. There's a guy, rock dude, playing the bass. People thought I could sample it from a disco record. That bass is being played for three and a half minutes. That pluck that I looped for one bar is goes by and it's just like you just listen to the bass that's the one and I'm in you know what I mean it's just like that's like you know I mean if there's any art to it I guess it's just that art of knowing I'm just about like sample a loop a beat loop a groove I'm done that's that I'm done it's just like no rocket science in it at all it's just all about that groove and what it, that groove does makes everything else secondary. I don't care, you can label it, title it, call it this, call it that, I start something, I don't start something. People hate me, people love me, I'm just in the studio, I make beats. That's what The simple art of making beats has elevated the DJ from someone who plays records into someone who makes them.
Since back in the day House emerged from the clubs of Chicago, DJ Pierre has been at the cutting edge of its many innovations. I mean like people like Daft Punk, Armand Van Helden, these people have have taken stuff and been they've been real creative. And and you can't say that these people haven't been more creative than or less creative than we were. Like, you know, if people say, Ah oh, Pierre, you started acid, you know, how do you feel about these people, you know, doing this and that and cutting taking your sound and I'm like, whose sound? Once it's on a record, it's like you, it's, it's like shareware. You know, sh you sharing it, and, and you allowing other people to add their own ideas. I mean, whatever I did, I guarantee you, I got it from somebody. Built on the ability to take ready-made sounds and create something new, house has redefined the very notion of music. You gotta keep learning in this business to stay on top. You can never say, oh, I'm not gonna listen to so and so, that's some new kid. What does he know? I'm like, these new kids come in with fresh ears. They like, oh, what if we do this? You know, just like when I was when I first started, I'm like, oh, you know, turning these knobs, doing stuff. So I mean you gotta keep learning. <laughs> Two thousand and one, and this restless quest for the perfect beat goes on in UK Garage. When Garage, UK Garage came out, it wasn't hip hop because we don't live that life. It wasn't, you know, R and B because I don't know, we don't live that life either. You know, it's not. It wasn't that, it was inner city music. It was the music that kids were making in their bedrooms, listening to, to radio and sampling tunes and, and just, just sticking their own thing on it. You know, you can tell it's, it's, it's England, it's UK, it's like, it's got that energy. We originally used to take tracks by producers like Todd Edwards and Master at Work, and they were just really sped up so you used to, you'd think, mm, I like the track. When I get to the club, you see everyone hyped and you think, oh, just touch it up on the deck a little bit. And it worked. I told it to this track, when it's sped up by that much, all of a sudden it has a whole different groove and a different feel. It appeared that we just wanted it a little bit more raw, a little bit, a bit more of a bass line, more for dancing than to, you know, easy listening kind of thing. So then there was this little, I don't know, little point, little transition where it was a grey area be between being, you know, the bump of the UK and the smooth of the US, and that's where it was born. While its roots may lie in America, the heart of UK Garage is the British underground club scene. get the raw material being the the basic 4-4 or the basic tempo of 128 to 130 which it would have got from house. A lot of it kind of stems from the old sort of ragga scene and the sound system uh, you know a lot of the chats picked up from there and a lot of the bass lines. It probably all stems right back from drum and bass you know there's always been that kind of nasty twisted um, bass sounding you know rough drums type thing which people like and you know UK Garage is, is as as drum and bass is just just evolved from from house music when you hit it in there i'm coming sharp he represents the west of london dt pipe on let it be an under we're loving it loving it loving it we're loving it like this we're loving it loving it this fusion of american house british breakbeat and reggae style mcs has already leapt out of the underground to dominate the charts and us in we drop uk garage has been sitting down for quite a while now and it still has it still has its place in clubland and um, there's still a, there is now a niche for it in you know in the big wide world of pop music. At the moment, we're taking jungle um, bass lines, we're taking Miami bass and hip hop beats, and we're putting R&B vocals on it, and we're speeding it up, and we're making it a garage track. And you know that's always the way it is. And that's, you know, and that's progressive. You know, as long as music progresses, then it's the important thing. Constantly reinventing itself, House's unique ability to create new genres 
is matched only by its irresistible power to move dance floors across the world. is the feeling and I think that if you don't feel it, it can't be house. It's always about bringing emotions out in people, making them feel great. I mean that's what the house is supposed to be, a good time. Crossing divisions of nation, race, sexuality and class, house has grown into an international phenomenon which shows no sign of stopping, ever. This isn't a new thing. People have been dancing to tribal rhythms for 40,000 years, probably more. It's not about to stop. It's just let it all out, let it all go, be free. That's what.